Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to Cinefix for another round table. Thanks for joining us. With me as always is T. Hi T, how you doing? Hi friends. And Billy Jackson, writer of Movie List, making your round table debut, I believe, right? It is my round table debut. Welcome. And the table is very round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry that your first time is you're not the special guest, because mm -hmm. we do have a special guest, Eric Heiser, writer of Arrival, which hits theaters this weekend. It does. Welcome. Thank you. Glad Welcome to, be here. to our humble round table. <laughs> yes. So, Arrival. I got to see it uh, early. Uh, our review is going to go up um, later this week, but it, I, it was great. I, <laughs> spoiler alert on the review. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Billy, you're super pissed that yeah, I Yeah, recently you. discovered uh, that you had a plus one to that, uh, <laughs> to that arrival screen that you yeah. did not use. Yeah. Neither T nor I, nor really you're anybody. You're salt from two sides right I know, here on that I one. I know. I would feel bad, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the point is, it's, uh, it's, as far as Cinefix is, is concerned, it's a very highly anticipated movie. Is it adapted from a, a short story or a full, it was a, like yes. a novella? Yes. Ted, story. I'll, it, it's, I don't know what the qualifications are for right. those. Like, yeah. I don't know, there's a threshold yeah. somewhere, like or word counter pages or whatever it is. Um, but it's Ted Chang, uh, and the original is called Story of Your Life. And I read it many, many years ago, fell in love with it, uh, really deeply emotionally affected by it, and, and said, I've got to torture other people with this feeling. You know, right. I've got to make sure I can broadcast that to a wider audience so that everyone can share in the sorrow. Uh, yeah. But also, it's uplifting at the same time. It's a real, it's a real hat trick that he pulled. And, um, and I just went around for many years Every time a producer sat down with me and they gave me the bottle of water, they're like, is there a story out there that we could get the rights to? And I would say, yes, yes. Ted Chiang, story of your life. It's a sci-fi, non-franchise, female lead. Where are you going? Yeah, they <laughs> come back. They, they, give, they take the water <laughs> they away. Take the, yeah. <laughs> or they take the Fiji yeah, and they, they give just you like, the yeah, Ozarka. I'm there sorry, you know. yeah, security. <laughs> uh, so it was, uh, it was a long slog until I found, uh, I found uh, Dan Levine and Dan Cohen at 21 Laps. Mm -hmm. Uh, who engaged with it the way I did, and we kind of were the three musketeers for it. And we were like, yes, we're going to make this movie. And we went out and we pitched it first uh, and to all the studios. And they were like, that's a fantastic idea. We're not making that movie. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, the, I guess the note that I got most was... Uh, Can very, you put Spider-Man in it? Can you put Spider-Man? Exactly. <laughs> Is there a way to put... Right. Can you make the lead a male? Yeah. That was another one. Right. That was another. Is there a way to just make this... You really got that note? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Man. yeah. That's or, brutal. Uh, or, you know, this is way too cerebral for audiences. You're, you know, audiences aren't that smart. Mm -hmm. So just make it a standard invasion movie where, like, a human punches right. an alien at the end of it. That was a big Welcome deal. Welcome to Earth. Welcome to Earth. At some Earth. point, can if Hold it's on. A, I'll, You're saying that well, there is no alien punching at the end? No. Sadly, no. So no. this, this may, like, one. drop our, yeah, our audience. Keep your plus yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See, this is why I didn't invite I'm you. here for the, <laughs> the alien punching and nothing else. Yeah. yeah. It'll be special, like, you know, like, producer's cut for that, you know, ah. studio cut for that. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising, but it's it's upsetting in an expected way that the first, that a lot of them were like, can you make it a male lead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but having seen the movie, the answer is no. No. No, you yeah. just absolutely can't. And it seems like it was probably a really great match to work with Denis. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name because we always get crap for that in the comments. But, you know, he had the same issue with Sicario, where they really were like, well, we can give you a lot more money to make this movie if the lead is a male. But they were very much against that, him and the writer. I think the main question, though, because, I mean, we're here to talk about sci-fi. Too cerebral for audiences kind of flies sort of in the face of what has made sci-fi great for generations. I guess I'm segueing where... No, you, yeah. no, Someone's I don't know where I'm segueing to, but I'm segueing. You're one for <laughs> one on segues. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sci-fi, you know, ideally is about the fiction more than the science. Sometimes the story that it's telling and sort of the, the sci-fi backdrop of it, uh, that's my personal favorite is, is you know... It's, it's a story about these people, and it just happens to be taking place during an alien uh, arrival. So yeah, the idea that a sci-fi movie could be too cerebral does sort of fly in the face of the, our most successful science fiction movie. I don't know. Like, I think sci-fi, more than many other genres, demands more of the audience. And unless it's, you know, unless it's the, the, the one where an alien gets punched in the face at the end, you know, mm -hmm. it, which is uh, then it's basically an action adventure movie sort of masquerading or dressing up, cosplaying as sci-fi, mm -hmm. as sci-fi. But, but that also allows you to engage more with your audience. You know, to, when you treat them 
uh, at a at a level saying we think you can you can go go at least this far. Mm -hmm. We're saying as a st as storytellers in sci-fi, we're going to give you two plus two. We're not going to give you four. Yeah, I think there's kind of an additional challenge with telling sci-fi stories of just having to kind of you got a lot of splaining to do at the top. You know, you kind of have to create this framework of like what the science is in terms of like what we need to know about this particular world that you're creating. And then on top of that, you have to tell the actual narrative. So I think I do agree with you. I'm not really super keen on the movies that are like too bogged down in the actual like science of itself. Mm -hmm. But I think the best movies do kind of satisfy explaining that well enough so that you can almost forget it and then just focus on the characters and the story. But in terms of cerebral, I think there's that, that one thing you're talking about, which is like hard versus soft sci-fi, which is like how into the science and being, you know, being realistic about quantum mechanics right. and, um, <clears throat> you know, particle physics and chemistry we want to be. But then you've also got this other form of, of cerebral that uh, lives with sci-fi going back to like the tradition of like sci-fi literature and sci-fi I think at its best engages with the philosophy of being a human and a human a part of the universe and I think that that and I haven't seen it, thanks, Clint. But I, <laughs> I get the vibe from the trailer, which is all I've seen, thanks, Clint. Yep. <laughs> um, that uh, the arrival is kind of like uh, building towards this this sense of like uh, like this oceanic philosophic sense at the end, hopefully, and that's what I'm really excited about, to be like, what kind of uh, questions are we asking about humankind? Right. Well, certainly we carry a strong theme of communication mm -hmm. and the importance of that, of clarity of intent and of not jumping to conclusions or knee-jerk reactions. And considering where we are as a society right now, we are more interconnected than ever. Everyone has a mouthpiece now. Like there's an accessibility to communication on a worldwide level that we haven't seen, and we are so terrible at it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's worse just really, than ever. Yeah, it is. We are absolutely embarrassing bad. So like, I would not want aliens to arrive right now. That would not be a good time. Let's give us a few more, at least decades to kind of get our. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, so we touched on. Obviously, we're we're all we're all fans of the more cerebral stuff. The 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 not the not welcome to Earth, face punching types I, of stuff. I like both. I mean, not necessarily welcome to Earth, but more I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, those aren't super, like, legit in terms of science, but then we also have a movie like The Martian, which actually has, like, a lot of legitimate science in it mm -hmm. and still manages to be really fun and humorous and quirky and really good on, like, character and storytelling. So there is a spectrum there where, you know, you have these sort of more existential, like, human condition oriented science fiction movies and then other ones where it's really just kind of more like popcorn science fiction. Yeah. Well like you said, action adventure masquerading exactly. in, in sci fi clothing. Well when you're talking about Cameron, you're talking about gourmet popcorn. Mm -hmm. Maybe because he just he puts he's a perfectionist. That's you know, a that eight dollar arc light popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Even in, uh, more recently, uh, Edge of Tomorrow or Live Die Repeat, whichever one you want to call it. I thought that was uh, great gourmet was, popcorn. It was great gourmet popcorn. District um, nine? So uh, well, District Nine went for went a little more existential with it. I mean, it, it, it it's really you know an entire allegory about uh, apartheid and all of that, yeah. which is a little more than gourmet popcorn. Like right. that's at least some snow caps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a, that's what we'll start doing now is ranking. Uh, we'll, we'll assign different sorts of candy to different uh, different. So if, if District Level Nine of prestige, is, yeah, you know? exactly. What was gravity then? If District Nine was uh, was snow caps, <laughs> gravity's like a nerd's rope. A nerd's? A yeah. nerd's rope? Yeah. I don't even know what that is. Explain a nerd's <laughs> rope for me. It's like a it's like a uh, a licorice rope embedded with nerds. That's this, not a this, thing. Is this something? That's that a thing. Do you buy two things and make it one it. thing? Yeah. No, it's you, you, bu it? you buy the nerds. You they they the fuse it for and me. You, like put nerds into no, your no, no, no. It's pre-fused. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then, what are what are some of our if if we're into the the James Cameron uh, gourmet popcorn science fiction? What are some of, some of the more sort of speculative kind of science fiction? The movies movies like Children of Men and things mm -hmm. like that that are. Her. Like, Exactly. Things oh, like let's yeah. look at like a a sort of logical end of a path that we're sort of currently on. I recently saw a movie called Embers. I'm guessing none of you guys saw it because it was a very oh, yes. small independent movie. It's great. It's so good. It's so great, and it's definitely you know 
hinged upon a sci-fi premise because it takes place in this sort of post-apocalyptic world where people are largely wiped out and the people who are still around uh, have this repeating amnesia where they constantly are forgetting who they are, where they are, who they're with, and it happens to everyone um, repeatedly throughout the day. But it's not about that. Like, even though, like, that's what the movie's about, it's not about that. It really is about the relationships and the behaviors of the characters within it. So I think that's really, if that's where science fiction filmmaking is going, I'm excited. What about a movie like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? Is that kind of sci-fi? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. And what's, what's interesting about that is we talked some about, like, a hard science fiction sort of groundwork of you have to explain the science of what's going on in some of these movies. But this is one where it, like, doesn't explain any of that at all. They're like, we have this machine that does this thing, mm -hmm. yeah. and done. It, it's science fiction that doesn't have really any exposition, except for the emotional half of it. I mean, one of the things I think about when I'm thinking about science fiction, and, and the question in my head is like, what makes something science fiction? Because it seems like on these two ends of the spectrum, there are these films that share a lot of, uh, uh, that share one thing or another with like the core of the genre, but very little with each other. I mean, you know, Eternal Sunshine shares very little with, uh, with Avatar. I mean, they're, they're not particularly similar in very many ways. And, and this raises questions on like what makes... There is a guy laying down plugged into something for like the whole movie. Oh, shoot. <laughs> You burn. Sorry, yeah. interrupt. <laughs> Splitting hairs with you. The difference, though, that I, I feel like you get into that ex exposition world or that road that you start to travel down when you you do ha when you have characters trying to figure something out. In Eternal Sunshine, uh, that wasn't the objective. It's like we got to figure out how this memory wiping machine works. No, no. I, I need a, I need it for something. Mm -hmm. right. And so, okay, well then let's focus on your need instead of the technology. Yeah. Whereas like Avatar, it's like we got to figure out how these people operate so that we can oppress them. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So let me explain that to you for a little yeah. while. Yeah, no, that's, that's one, of the, one of the funny things I've, I've heard about exposition and like sort of rules of, of how to use exposition. If you have like two particle physicists, they're not going to explain particle physics to each other. No. Because they like, they both know. So it's but they like, can argue it. Right. Right, so it's it's trying to figure out the the sneaky way to make sure the audience is is educated in a believable way without just spitting it at people. And honestly, like in early drafts of Arrival, the script, I had you know I had to explain linguistic relativity to people. I had to talk about Sapir Whorf hypothesis, and and on the science side, I had Fermat's principle of least time, Snell's law. I had like some crazy stuff, yeah. and. Uh, you know, my first draft was like, wow, this is a $50 million TED Talk. What am I doing? <laughs> this is not right. And, uh, and I really had to, like, uh, you know, get some, uh, some tension between people, especially when you have some people in the military, like uh, Colonel Weber, played by Forrest Whitaker, uh, who would come in and say, I got to go and explain this to a room full of people that are all like, you know, are we giving up our whole country to, to these aliens by just offering these things? So, like, um, it forces them in sort of like at a point of conflict to talk about why they need to. They had to justify the jobs. Right. Is it the scene where she writes, what is your purpose on earth on, on the whiteboard? Oh, yeah, that. That's a, that's a great scene for like just creative way of, uh, you know, exposition, of explaining what she's trying to do there. <laughs> Putting a simple phrase on the board and, and pointing out all the different ways that it can be misunderstood and misinterpreted and how these aliens won't have any idea what we're talking about. That came out of a notes meeting, actually. This is a little trivia about the film, but um, my first draft that I sent them when I was writing it on spec. I gave it to the producers. Their first major note was like, Eric, so there's two pages here kind of in the middle where you've got these A-list actors uh, basically teaching kindergarten level words to the aliens. And this is not sexy at all, Eric. I can't right. tell you how unsexy these two pages are. <laughs> Whole script. I can't believe you're doing this. Yeah. Why in the world would you do that? And I, and I got all huffy. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go with this whiteboard. And I wrote down that question. And I said, here's what we're trying to get to. And here's all the reasons why you need to do this kind of basic building work, and that you can't start specific, that you have to start with the basics, and you have to make sure the, the difference in pronouns, you know, between plural and singular, so you don't like it an answer why Joe Alien is here. <laughs> you don't want that. You want to know why all of them are here. Yeah. And, and at the end of it, you have to make sure they have enough vocabulary that when they answer, you know what their answer is. And they looked at me and they were like, that's the scene. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what you put in it, Eric. Yeah. You get halfway you get through explaining it. Like, you know what? Goose. You know what? I'll, be right I'll, be, I'll just gotta. That sounds like thought, uh, guys. a really good scene I would have liked to have uh, seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, cool. Any, is there any other types of sci fi that we left out? 
Time travel, yeah. apocalyptic. Yeah. Um, Post apocalyptic. How about Mad Max? Does Mad Max count as sci fi? So, so, genre theorists, I think, would talk about this uh, in terms of uh, genres having sets of both like syntactics and semantics, where syntactics are the set of like cosplaying as sci fi. These are set in space, includes time travel, um, you know, laser guns in the future. Uh, hooked up to your brain, uh, those are syntactics. And semantics involves like tackling core themes, like what is humanity's purpose? What is the greater meaning of our existence? And that the, the sci-fi genre kind of exists in this nexus between the two, and you can have none of, the, none of these thematic questions and all the syntactics, and people will still call it sci-fi, and, and you can have none of the space stuff, and, and mostly ask these questions and people still be like, well, it's sort of like a sci-fi but without the space thing. So it's sort of mm -hmm. both and they're different and they often work together but sometimes don't. Yeah. I don't yeah, know if there's I a think, true sci-fi. I think sci being in space is one of the first things that we sort of associate at least visually with sci-fi, but there are so many sci-fi movies and franchises that don't have anything to do with space. Right. I mean, even if you look at like Under the Skin with Scarlett Johansson, like there's no space in that, but it's definitely got like that weird sort of alien sci-fi element right here on Earth. So I don't really think space is necessarily like the qualifier. It has more to do with exploring things that are beyond the world that we actually know around us. And one of the things we were chatting about before we, we started was that I, it, what's strange about some of the, those sort of the trappings of sci-fi movies, the space and the laser guns and things like that, is talking about how, how genres uh, or science fiction kind of starts in a hole a little bit. Like you have to yeah. work a little harder for people to get sci-fi, to take sci-fi seriously. And I think sure. in part because of the things like, oh, it's just a bunch of guys with laser guns. Right, and they, they don't look beyond that. You know, and if you're using the guys with laser guns as a metaphor for like either the human condition or to explore something that's happening either culturally or politically, at the time, I mean, Twilight Zone, I think, was a science fiction series that was really just a way to like put a filter over some really hardcore political views and counterpoints to what was going on. Mm -hmm. I think you can even find like uh, sci science fiction films that really have none of those trappings at all. I think something like uh, Stalker, uh, by Tarkovsky, really like doesn't has just like this sort of like general air of science fiction, but there's nothing particularly futuristic about it, or even uh, Synecdoche, New York, or a lot, even Adaptation, have these kind of like weird, it's more magical realism than sci-fi, but it's, it's yeah. tackling these thematics that you associate with sci-fi, and I think it's interesting. Well, Eric, thanks for, for coming by, man. Thanks, really guys. Thanks for the round table. Absolutely. Yes, you can take Glad you can make it. Um, <laughs> everybody go check out Arrival this weekend, comes out this weekend. It's, it's real good. Apparently. Real good. Yeah, <laughs> guess I'll have to take your word for it, Clint. All right, everybody, that is uh, a lot of stuff about sci-fi. We talked about a lot. I don't know if we decided anything. Not really. No. Not really, no. But that's, that's again, the great thing about science fiction. And round I, learned, I, I learned that nerd ropes yeah. exist. Nerd ropes? That's right. Well, I, I still don't think they actually exist. Yeah. They Jury's exist. still out on nerd ropes. I think you're bullshitting me. Guys, let us know down in the comments below if you've ever heard of a nerd rope. Uh, <laughs> and also, what's your favorite type of sci-fi? What's your favorite sci-fi movie? Let us know down in the comments below. And again, please go see Arrival. It's super good. Eric, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll see you guys next time.